My goodness, what powerful testimony, you guys. Thanks for sharing that. Um, just just amazing to, to see. Uh, this morning, my sermon is on injustice, um, the injustice that we see in the world around us and that we experience in our own life. How do we handle this? And, uh, and how does God show up in those things? And gosh, what a, uh, you know, I love how God weaves these together. I mean, talk about uh, some of the injustice going on in the world right now. Um, just a crazy, crazy deal. So Michael, last week uh, in Easter, introduced this new topic to us. He goes before you. And that's what uh, he ends the book of Mark with this concept, uh, just kind of like leave you hanging like, hey, guess what? Jesus is going to be working in your future. He's going to be preparing things. He's going to be setting up these encounters. He's going to be uh, showing you the needs of people. And, and he's going to be ahead of you doing work. And he, he's going to see you there. And here's the problem. Sometimes we see him and sometimes we miss him. Right? And, and we, we get too busy, we get too distracted. Uh, and, and so our, our hope through this next five weeks is that we look for the areas where God shows up in our life. What, what types of places does he show up? And one of the ways that he shows up mightily is when we experience injustice. When we see when something that is not fair happens to us, and God is present in those moments. So be looking for him. That's what we're hoping throughout the course of this next half hour, that you would, you would start to see where God shows up in the presence of injustice. And God is working in your life and he's doing big things. So we're going we're gonna to start this by reading the life of Stephen, talking a little bit about the life of Stephen from Acts chapter 6 and 7. If you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to turn there. We're not going to have these scriptures on the screen. Uh, later we'll have the, the kind of the main scriptures on the screen. But I just want to kind of get a brief overview of who the Stephen was from Acts chapter 7, what he lived like and what he, um, how, he, how he lived his life. And uh, uh, just kind of get into that. So Acts chapter 6 and 7, um, we're going to kind of start in verse uh, chapter 6 verse 1 um, and some of the, re read a little bit about this. So, but as the believers rapidly multiplied, there was rumblings of disconnect, con content. The Greek-speaking believers uh, complained about the Hebrew-speaking believers, saying that their widows were being discriminated against for food. Okay, the church was having problems. Not a new thing. All churches have problems, right? There was some logistical things going on. They were having trouble feeding. Uh, somebody was discriminating, right? They probably started off with good intentions. We're going to take care of these ladies. And then they ended up being treating them too well. And then it caused dissension, right? All this stuff. This is not new. So the 12 apostles, verse 2, call the meeting the believers. We apostles spend our time teaching the word of God and not running a food program. So brothers, let's select seven men who are well respected, are full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. We'll give them this responsibility. Verse 4, then the apostles, we can spend our time in prayer and teaching the word. Everyone liked the idea? And they chose the following. The first one I'm going to read. Stephen. He was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to stop there. So here he is, Stephen. The first introduction to Stephen is he's a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And we know from the previous description, he was well respected. He was full of the Spirit. He had wisdom. Right, and so we get this this picture of this guy. Man, he must have been an amazing man. They called him into leadership from amongst them. They're like, you know that that Stephen guy, he'd be a great at handling some of the issues, some of the challenges our church is facing. Let's let's get him in leadership. Right, he steps up. He becomes this this leader. In verse eight. Uh, of chapter 6. Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed amazing signs and miracles among the people. But one day, some of the men uh, of the synagogue uh, debated with him, and uh, none of them, verse 10, none of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit which Stephen spoke. So here again, we got Stephen. He's He's, he's got this wisdom. He's got this knowledge. He can debate with these people. He's talking, telling them about Christ and telling them how he is 
the Messiah, the one that they had been promised, right? And so, man, this Stephen, he's got a bright future. Think about this guy, full of grace, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. He's a powerful leader. He's the kind of guy you want to follow. You're like, man, I, gosh, that would be a sweet leader. This guy knows his stuff. He's good. He's wise. He's strong. He knows the Lord, right? He's well-respected. It's just this awesome thing. And then, after all this happens, we fast forward to chapter 7. He gets in this big, long debate, and he has this huge presentation of why Jesus is the Messiah. He's trying to convince these Jewish followers that, hey, you, you only got the first half of the story. Everything you believe is true, but guess what? It all just points us to Christ. This whole thing we've been doing, we've been uh, living our lives for, it just points us to the Messiah. Jesus was that Messiah. And he goes through this amazing chapter 7, and we don't have time to read it today, but I hope you can study it this week and look at this, this chapter that uh, he just uh, presents this amazing presentation. And he gets to the end of it. And he, in verse 54, this is where we want to kind of pick up our main story. When the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious. And they gnashed their teeth. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven, saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. He gets this vision right in front of all of Jesus and God right there. And he's just like, wow, look, there he is. At this, they covered their ears, yelling at the top of their voices. They did not want to hear this. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coat at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Verse 60, the last one. Then he fell on his knees, cried out, Lord, don't hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. It's just this crazy moment where this young church, this movement of Christians coming together, following God, and you have this amazing leader named Stephen Probably this young man that's just showing all this promise. He's well-respected. He has a passion for the Lord. All this great things going on. And his life is abruptly ended after he tells this amazing story. And I, I just kept thinking about this. You know all the times Paul escaped from these things? If you read the rest of the book of Acts, uh, as we will can keep hearing about Paul later on in this story, uh, in this series, it's crazy how many times Paul gets out of things like this, right? God provides this like way out. He's like, hey, it's not your time yet. I got more work for you to do. It's not your time yet. I got more work for you to do. And he escapes death again and again. And yet Stephen, this amazing guy, and I was reading this this week. I'm like, man, if I was God, have you ever said that before? Dangerous thing to say, right? If I was God, I would have probably kept Stephen around. I would have made a way out for Stephen and had him, you know, do all this amazing. I mean, look at what kind of guy he was. All these descriptions we got of this guy. This guy sounds awesome. Why would God cut his life short? Why would God do this? Why would God allow this terrible thing to happen to Stephen? He had so much potential. He had so much life left. You know, I found myself asking that question not just about Stephen, but other people. I'm sure you have too. Why, God? Why would you allow something like this to happen? Why would all this suffering, all this pain, all the, the life cut short, why would you allow this to be part of Stephen's life? So this morning, I want us to ask that question as we turn to Scripture for our source of truth and go, okay, God, what is it? Why why do things like this happen? Why did Stephen's life end? And I just want us to look at three principles. I'm not going to give us the answer, right? Some of these answers go deeper than just a textbook, right? This is is God uh, speaking to us, right? And sometimes it's hard 
to process this stuff. But I want us to, to find three principles that we can grab from Scripture that help us as we walk through this question. God, why? Why would you allow this to happen? And some of you right now may not be going through terrible injustice, right? Maybe your life's going great. That's awesome, right? And um, I, I was like, well, how do I speak to people that are having a good, you know, everything's great in their life? Well, first off, good for you, right? That's awesome that everything's perfect in your life, right? Most of us aren't that way, right? We're challenges. But here's the deal. We're in one of three spots. Either you're in a storm right now, you're just coming out of a storm, or you're getting ready to go into a storm, right? All of us are in somewhere that boat. So this idea of injustice, of suffering, of challenge, it applies to all of us. Maybe not right at the moment, but, but we know that suffering is just part of life. Injustice is just a part of this life. Jesus said it this way, right? In, in this life, you will have troubles. You'll have tribulation. You're going to have trials. But don't be afraid. I have overcome the world. He is bigger. He's stronger. And that brings us to our first, uh, first reminder from Scripture, and that's uh, simply this, that God will bring all things to justice. He is a just God, and he will be the judge of what was right and what was wrong. Romans 12, 19, where I get this. Um, Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. Think about that, righteous anger of God. You know God gets angry. When there's injustice in the world, he does get angry at this. And he is, he does have a plan to judge those atrocities that have gone on. Keep reading, righteous anger of God. For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. So God has a plan for this, right? We, we can trust knowing as believers in Christ, that uh, knowing that what he's done for us, that he has a plan to make all things right. He has a purpose for this. But goodness sakes, how many of you ever struggle with a verse like this? Because you want to get back and you want to get even for those things that happen, right? Somebody does something to you and it's just like, yeah, I really want to get back at that person, right? We have a hard time saying, oh, God, God will take care of it. He'll, he'll even out the, the rights and the wrongs someday, right? No, I kind of want some righteous anger right now, God. Like, let's, let's make this happen. Let's make this person pay for what they did, right? This is hard as Christians, uh, this is a hard, hard thing. Man, when I was a kid, I remember the first time I felt this. I don't know if you have your memory of this, too. But for me, it was I was at a, a water park, and my little brother, uh, I don't know how old we were, 10, whatever, but he's four years younger than me, and uh, playing in the water, and we were having a good time. And everybody had their own tube, you know? You're going down the lazy river or something. And this kid comes out, and he tries to grab the tube from my little brother and yank it away from him. And he was just standing there holding it. It's like, dude, you had to wait in line, get the tube, you know, blah, blah, blah. And he, he, he grabs the tube and tries to pull it away from my little brother. And my brother's like hanging on to it, like, what's going on? And all of a sudden, the kid just slaps my, my brother right across the arm. Just like, wham! And I was like, oh, no, you didn't, right? You know, you ever get that feeling, right? Where you're just like inside you, you're like, oh! And thankfully, the kid... Like ran away, right? I, I wasn't, I didn't, I didn't go to jail or anything, right? It was just like he just took off. But that feeling, you you know the feeling, right? Where you're just like, mm, in that moment, you just wanna take somebody out. Like you can't do, you can't treat people that way. In my home, we grew up, we don't we don't treat people that way, right? But that's, oh my gosh, it just I remember being so angry, right? And that's that's a good anger, right? There was there was injustice that went there. But guess what? As believers. We're not called to act out and, and, and make that, you know, administer that justice. We got to put this back in God's hand and go, you know what? God, you've called us to, to trust you for the justice, to give, put it back in your hands. I will repay. I'll pay them back, says the Lord. Uh, man, there's, there's so many times where that, that happens, right? And God does, and he will. Revelation 20, 11 through 15 talks about the final judgment 
of the world, right? He's going to call everybody before him. Every knee will bow before him. And there's going to be a final judgment. It, it says there's books. And he's going to, all of our deeds, all the things we've ever done are going to be written down. And, and uh, he's going to call us to account, right? But the cool news is there's another book. He pulls it out a little bit later and he goes, boom, Lamb's Book of Life. Is your name in here? Have you put your faith in Jesus? Guess what? All these, all these terrible deeds you've done, will be judged, but they're judged on Jesus Christ, right? The judgment was passed to him. And if your name's in the book of life, you get to go on to be eternity. And it talks about this whole, in, in that revelation, right? There is going to be time where those people that got away with stuff are going to be judged. They're going to have to face judgment and on, from God, right? It's an amazing, it's a crazy thing. Some of you have been hurt deeply by other people. Some of you have wounds that run deep. And some of those people have got away with it. But I'm here to tell you, nobody gets away with it. God's the judge. He knows what's happened. And he knows what's going on. Some of you have hurt people deeply. You don't get away with it. God's the judge. He sees all that goes on. Right? Here's the deal, though. We do kind of get away with it. Some of those people will get away with it because the judgment goes on Jesus Christ. That's the good news of being a Christian. If we put our faith and our trust in him, he's the one that takes it from for us, that brunt of that. Crazy. Hmm. But at the end of the day, things won't always make sense this side of heaven. Romans 8, 28 is a verse that I've turned to as a chaplain many times, right? God works together for good for those who walk with him. God works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. So God has a way of taking messy situations, pain, suffering, and turning them into something beautiful. Have you seen this in your life? I'm sure many of you have, right? Where God's taken a challenging time and he's turned it into something beautiful, right? Something difficult that you've gone through. Um, the hard thing is trying to comfort someone with these words when they've just gone through a tragedy, right? If they've had some terrible thing happen to them, it can be really difficult to say, hey, oh, don't worry about it. God's going to God's gonna work it out into something beautiful in your life, right? Those can be hard words for people when they're in the midst of suffering, um, trying, to, uh, trying to offer peace to them. Uh, what I've found, uh, and I'm man, not a pro at this by any means, but uh, having, being a chaplain in this community and being sometimes the first or second, third person on a scene uh, from somebody that just lost a loved one to suicide or to, to, to just a tragedy, right? Car accident and being there, and, and gosh, they'll even ask questions, but I've found, man, the best thing you can do to offer is just be a presence, right? And so I know some of you are going to be comforting people that are going through tragedies in the weeks and months to come. Man, I just encourage you, just be a presence. Don't try to give them all the answers. The best thing someone needs when they're going through tragedy is you there and just saying, hey, I care. I care about you. What can I do to help, right? Um, and just try to offer, offer that, right? And as time goes on, they may ask questions like, why would God let this happen? Why did, why did this bad thing happen to me, right? And in those moments, you can, you can share the, the basic principles, right, of, of what these are. God, God will bring justice. These things can work to good, for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But not all the stuff we, we experience makes sense, but we know that God's got a plan and a purpose. So God will bring about justice at some point, but we have to let him do the justice, not us. And boy, that's hard sometimes. Let's move to the second principle I want us to remember about God's justice. And this one's important. God is more concerned about your eternal state than, than about the temporary injustice that goes on in your life. Man, that suffering, that issue, that problem. I mean, he's way more concerned about how, where's your soul at? Where, where are you at for eternity 
than he is about the temporary injustice. Mark 8, if you try, uh, uh, Mark 8, 35, this is, uh, oh, and it's up on the screen, there we go. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world yet lose your soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? Whew. These are deep words from Jesus. We get so bent out of shape over all the things that are going on in our day-to-day -day lives, and we forget we are eternal beings. God designed us not just to live once and then die and we're all done, but he, he's given us this life as an opportunity to invest in eternity. This is our time to invest for eternal life. We are eternal beings. Isn't that a crazy thing to think about? Uh, especially in our world today. I feel like we're constantly bombarded with the message that you only live once. YOLO, right? What is that that the kids are saying nowadays? Did I get it? Yeah. You, you only live once. This is it. So you got to do, do it all now. This is, this is the time to experience the best, right? But here's the truth. We, we live for eternity. You are an eternal being. And we have a choice, right? We have a choice whether we can live in eternity with God or eternal separation from God. Eternal suffering. We have that choice. And how we live today makes all the difference. The choices we make today make all the difference, including the one main choice. Have you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ? Is your name in that book? Have you committed your life to him? But boy, it's hard to get, we get so distracted with the temporary and we miss the eternal things. C.S. Lewis said, and I love this, everything that not, is, oh, I'm sorry, everything that is not eternal is worthless in eternity. Think about that. You have something, I got, I got this thing that's going to last 200 years. That's a long time. Yeah, but 10,000 years from now, will you even remember it? That's, eternity is a long time. The things, if we invest all of our time into things that are temporary, they're worthless, they're a worthless currency in the eternity. Man, everything that's not eternally is worthless in eternity. Hmm. The important thing, we are eternal beings. We need to start thinking long-term. This is what Jesus encourages us to do. Think long-term. Don't store up treasures on earth where it all is going to just be gone. Store up treasures in heaven. And it's crazy. It's hard to imagine, but every one of us is going to pass through that valley of the shadow of death at some point in our life. You know, some of us have been spared from that. Almost, I bet there's a lot of, I bet there's a handful of you in here that can tell us some pretty crazy near-death experience, right? God, whew, I was this close and God saved me, right? But all of us at some point or another are gonna face death. It's crazy to think that in this room here, there may, some of you may walk through that valley in this next year, right? There, group of us in here, there's, some of us may walk into eternal life with Jesus in the future, in this next year. We're, we have that very real possibility, and it's all coming to all of us at some point. We are going to pass through the shadow of death. It's just it's crazy. Just this week, Easter Sunday, last, last Sunday, uh, we had two deaths that happened in our community and in our church on, on Sunday, and it was just a, uh, it was a crazy thing. But one of them, um, Barb Potsman, I think a lot of you guys know, she's a realtor in this community, a strong Christian lady, um, passed away of cancer um, on Easter Day. And just uh, her testimony, the things she wrote at the end, you're just going, you know what, God, uh, God has got this. I'm at peace. And I'm moving, moving forward to the next stage of my life is how she worded it. Just what faith, right? I'm, I'm moving to the next thing. It's not over. She has that faith and that confidence. Um, another fatality I went to, just terrible uh, tragedy of a, a young man taking his own life on Easter about the same time. Right, uh, hearing a story, don't know where he was at with the Lord, right? But really, some some dark things going on, some troubles. But 
boy, there's, there's a palette. This, this life is temporary, guys. We are eternal beings. What, what a crazy um, contrast of things that happened on Easter Sunday last, last week. The challenges come, but here's what God's more concerned about. Your eternal destiny. What's going to last forever, not about the temporary. God, man, we got to get back to thinking about this as Christians. We, this is why we're here, guys. We're called to help point everyone to eternal significance. And remember that ourselves, because we get distracted so easily with the temporary at times. So that's pretty important because it kind of leads into this next one. If God's more concerned about eternal things, then the last one is this. Injustice and suffering help us to be more fruitful as humans, right? If we want to grow. We want to be, if, if we want to not just be so focused on the temporary, sadly, suffering, injustice, they help us to grow. That's exactly what we tell our young people, right? You want to be a good athlete? What do you got to do? You got to push through the suffering, right? You got to you gotta get up early and you got to go for a run. You got to do all the, the repetitions that you're supposed to do day in and day out, whatever athletics that you're in, right? It's hard. It's exhausting. There's days you want to quit. But we want to push our young people, hey, if this is your dream, go. Like, push through the pain and the suffering because you can do this, right? And the fruit is you get to be a better athlete, right? Only, only a select few actually make it. So you got, you got to, be the, to be the best of the best. You have to go through a ton of suffering and pain. We do it with education, right? Our, our school systems, we got to teach our young people and, and they got to go through all this learning process. Gosh, it's hard work sometimes. I was uh, helping my uh, five-year-old, right? Learning to, to read and write and all these things. Oh my goodness, it's hard work. You teachers are saints, man. Because it's like, uh, you know, mind-numbing at times. Like, going over the same things over and over again, and then you go back, they forgot it all already. Okay, here, let's try it again, right? It's like, oh my goodness, you, you teachers are amazing the way you uh, educate these kids. It's hard work, but as they suffer through that, as they go through this challenging time, they become better. There's fruit from it, right? Education, athletics, it's no different in our spiritual walks and in our lives Man, I don't know what it is, but sometimes we just think we deserve the easy road. Man, if I, if I could just have life be easy, it'd be great. And God's here, he's saying, no, I don't, I don't want the easy road for you. In fact, the challenges are going to come. They're going to be because they make you a better person. I'm way more concerned about you growing in your spiritual walk and growing and becoming this kind of person than I am about how comfortable you are, how easy life is. God wants, he's got way bigger plans than us just being comfortable, right? He's, so there are going to be challenges. There's going to be things that come our way that are going to challenge us and push us and cause us to grow. Romans 3 Five, three through five, New Living Translation. We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they help us develop endurance. We need that pushing through thing. And endurance develops strength of character, and our character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead us to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with that love. Man, we, we can have this confidence. I love that progression, right? We go through trials. Oh, yeah, that stinks. Nobody likes that. But that gives endurance. That helps us to be able to, to keep going. And as we keep going, we start to get this hope and this peace and this knowledge of that's exactly what we're looking for. That's what we want as Christians is to be able to show off hope like a beacon to everyone around us. Man, look at that person. They're so full of hope for what the future holds, even in the face of death. The last few minutes of their life, they're still able to say, hey, listen, this isn't all, man. God's got, man, I get to be with him soon. Just like Stephen, right? The last words coming out of his mouth. Man, look at God. He's up there. He's right there. 
oh, Father, forgive these people. They don't know what they're doing. I, I, he's got hope for something greater in his life. Can you imagine what your last words will be? What will you be thinking about? Assuming you get the chance, right? What, what, would, you, what would your final words be as you leave this earth and go through that shadow of death to eternity? What will you think about? What will you say? What will you see? Maybe, you, maybe you'll see heaven open and there's God right there in front of you. I've heard story after story, uh, being in chaplain, being in the nursing home, of people that, that have seen Jesus in their room the final day, right? That have, hey, Jesus is here. What? And the family looks around like, what is going on? This, this person is given a vision of God in their final moments of life. Man, what will life be like for us? What will those final moments be as we show off to the world, to those around us, that Jesus is with us? He gives us hope. Crazy to think about. C.S. Lewis said this, hardships prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. Hardships prepare ordinary people for an extraordinary destiny. This is an important reminder as we go through this tough, tough times in life, we face suffering, injustice, things that just aren't fair, and yet we can grow from them. We can become better people. So important. Think of all the lives that were changed by Stephen being stoned. At the beginning, I started with, man, what if I was God, I would have let Stephen live. I would have made him go on. And But maybe God knew something else. Maybe, just like the scripture says, there's Stephen standing there, or uh, Stephen getting stoned, and standing off to the side as a guy named Saul. Right? Saul, who later is converted and becomes Paul. And I just wonder... Was there a seed that was planted in Paul's life in that moment as he watched this Jesus fanatic getting beaten with stones and cry out for forgiveness for the people who are doing it? Just wonder, is that, was that the seed that helped grow into Paul's conversion someday? Did God really know what he was doing when this all happened, when he got to experience this, when, when Stephen got to share the hope for eternity and then to turn around and give his life for that. What a crazy thing. What were the lives that were changed as a result of Stephen's testimony from suffering? And for us, we, God doesn't promise us an easy life. In fact, he, he says the opposite. There are going to be challenges in your life this week. I hope that as you go through whatever injustice comes your way, or whatever justice you see, that you would look for these principles. How is God growing fruit in my life? How, am I, how is he teaching me to think about eternity, and not about the temporary? And how am I letting go and letting him be the judge and not myself? I hope that we can do that this week. You are not put on this earth to live for yourself. You were put here to prepare for eternity. Rick Warren says this, you were not put on the earth to live for yourself. You were put here to get prepared for eternity. Let's think eternal-minded, folks. Let's pray. God, would you help us this week? We, we need help uh, being more eternal mindset. Uh, myself included, Lord, help us to think about the, the big picture, where you're going and what you're doing. God, help us as we just str we do struggle with injustice. It just seems so unfair that this would happen to me, whether it's cancer, whether it's uh, suffering, whether it's someone doing something. Lord, would you just help help us see the big picture? And back up and trust that you have a purpose and a plan for us. And you're doing something amazing for eternity. 
not just for the temporary. So thank you, God, that you show up in these things. Help us to look for you and not miss you in the tough times. We ask this in your name. Amen.